war work. It's out west, and that's all we're going to tell you. As Camp Hamford grew to over 50,000 residents, so too did the large concrete structures along the Columbia River. The basic design of B Reactor was derived from the experimental reactor built at the University of Chicago, albeit with one slight modification. The test reactor at Chicago operated at a power level of one half a watt. B would attain a power level of 250 million watts. B Reactor's core would be built as a three-story assembly of graphite blocks drilled through with a cylindrical lattice of channels into which would be inserted slugs of uranium metal coated with aluminum. Nine metal horizontal control rods separated the channels and 29 vertical safety rods were available to shut the process down. When the control rods were removed, the uranium would begin a reaction and create heat. Water from the Columbia River would flow through the channels for cooling. When the slugs had been sufficiently exposed, they would be pushed out the back of the core into a cooling pool and quickly decayed to plutonium. Once cooled, the irradiated plutonium would be transferred by special water-filled rail cars to the separation plants. These plants, called canyons by the workers, because of their long narrow shape, would use chemicals to separate the plutonium from the aluminum and other metals. Then the plutonium would continue on to final processing. And the fact that they could take uh, one metal and make another metal, transmutation for me, was uh, unbelievable. You figure the reactors are only designed for uh, just before the, the end of war. And that's all, all they were shooting for. And then six months after the Nagasaki bomb, uh, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, he made an announcement. He said, we are now in the midst of a Cold War with Russia. Well, at that point, then, hey, you know, these are no longer just a temporary uh, uh, reactor, these have got to keep going. And that's when they started doing all the major improvements and trying to figure out how to preserve them longer. The B reactor has a lot to say for uh, what it has accomplished. Since the process of producing plutonium was new and unproven, many construction techniques and procedures had to be invented as it went along. It was noted that the finished blueprints to B reactor were not even delivered to the site until two weeks after the reactor went critical. You talk about having to be innovative, they had to be innovative. The first uh, chief operator I had when I went to work out there went out to the reactors and I said, what's all these pipes? And he said, that's your job. He said, uh, a week from now I want you to come back and tell me where that pipe came from, where it goes to and what it did. And uh, that was just the way they taught us. You had to teach yourself. And if there was anything there that you was wondering about, you had to go make a drawing and figure out or make a statement on what it did. Uh, and that way you'd come up with different ways to, to make things better. On the job training was status quo and safety was always of utmost importance. Procedures were in place for any situation. Each control rod was connected to a sensor that would trigger the reaction to shut down if a problem was detected. This shutdown was referred to as a scram. Well, actually, uh, that scram came from the small test reactor in, in Chicago. There they had one safety rod hanging up on over a... Uh, pulley and down, tied down, and the man, if they wanted to set the reactor down, he'd take an axe and cut the wire, or cut the rope. And so that was safety control rod axe man. <laughs> so actually, of course I didn't know that until later on, I was uh, scram, just went scram out of the reactor. <laughs> We had to get out in a hurry. <laughs> the thing that becomes instilled, it's, it's second nature, is safety. These people who designed and built that, those machines out there, 
they didn't have a model to go by. If you're going to build a car, you can say, well, what did we do in 1906? What did we do in 1926? They couldn't do that out there. They started by saying, okay, uh, we know this can be done. We're not sure how to do it, but we're going to design and we're going to make sure that uh, there is uh, safety to the environment, to the populace in this area, and to the people who work here. And, and they did. Secrecy reigned supreme during the construction project. Groves and DuPont had developed a departmentalized procedure where workers on one part of the construction process had no knowledge or contact with any other area of the construction. It was understood, say nothing, ask nothing, and keep your job. Well, uh, one of the reasons that for me was, uh, like I said, my father was here as a security patrolman. And he said, just keep your mouth shut and you'll get along good. And uh, I, you'd be working with somebody one day and he wasn't there the next day. And you find out, well, he said something wrong. And he was just gone. Well, one way that they uh, proceeded while they were building B reactor was to have compartmentalization. In other words, if you're a person working on the graphite, that's all you're going to know about. You're not going to know about the pipes, and you're not going to know about the electrical systems. And if you're a water a thermal hydraulics expert working on the water delivery system, you're not going to know about the graphite. And so they kept uh, the work very separate, and they just had a few people. And it wasn't the construction workers. It was a few of the high-level supervisors who knew the entire scheme. On September 26, 1944, 18 months from beginning construction, B Reactor was activated. A small group of operators and scientists, led by Fermé, gathered around the control panels as theory became reality. Everything worked perfect as the power level was increased to 9 megawatts and held there. Then to everyone's surprise, the reactivity began to slowly decrease. The reactor was shut down, tests were conducted, and a hunt for leaks proceeded. The following morning, the process was started again, and the results remained the same. For the next two days, this mysterious loss of power baffled all involved. Then that Friday morning, September 29th, physicist John Wheeler had solved the mystery. It was an unexpected byproduct known as xenon, which was absorbing neutrons and spoiling the reaction. The original design of the reactor pile, devised at Chicago, called for 1,500 parallel channels be made for slug insertion, and DuPont was assured that this was all that was needed. DuPont's engineers, through conservatism or perhaps wariness of MetLab's overconfidence, had added 504 extra channels to the design. The solution was simple. Load more slugs into the extra channels and increase the reactivity to override the xenon effect. The fix worked, and atomic history was made. Well, B reactor was a, a, the perfect marriage of science and engineering because pure science was how does the physics reaction work, but engineering was how do you build a machine that can encompass this reaction, encase it, provide a safe atmosphere for it to operate in. And so the engineers at the DuPont Corporation added some extra tubes to the d original design that the scientists had put forth. And the scientists were um, sort of contemptuous and said, we don't need those. We've told you how many we need, and that's all we need. And the engineers said, well, if you fail, who's going to take the blame? And so at that point, the scientists said, OK, put in some extra tubes, You know, do what you want sort of thinking they will never be needed. They were needed. And so that's why the machine, B-reactor, is just as much a product of engineering as a product of science. 